I want to uh, congratulate Dr. Falek, Christine Mooney, Ed Hansen, and Ed Volchak for putting this uh, or conference together. And I'd like to welcome our friends from Westchester Community College and Nassau Community College. Where are you? There you are. Welcome. Welcome. My role is obviously to, to introduce the keynote speaker, but you can't give a president of a college a microphone and expect that you know, we're just going to do what we are told to do. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit about what perhaps you have seen in the last five minutes and you have been talking about for the last uh, two or three hours. And that is the idea that in community college education, it is absolutely imperative that we create cohorts of students. And we do that through either activities that we uh, put together, sort of, sort of like the Federal uh, Express, uh, uh, the Fed Challenge, or the mock trial competition, or any of the other uh, high impact activities that we have at the campus. But we do it also in our classes, in our student activities. Uh, we do it throughout the campus. And the rationale behind this is extremely important. When you have a commuter campus, when you have very busy students, it is very difficult to identify yourself as a student with an organization. You tend to identify yourself with a program and perhaps some of the students within that program. But it, the literature is replete with examples of students who are in open admissions environment in commuter colleges where cohort education does work. So the learning communities that we have at the college, not just the official learning communities where you have the linked courses, but the learning communities that you see in the hours of preparation for the mock trial competition, that's a learning community. Uh, the learning communities that exist uh, when students, are, the, the easiest one to to understand is perhaps students practicing for a play or students who are engaged in a athletic activity where they have to be together, have to get to know one another, where they have common goals. All of that contributes uh, to the success of our students. So I really congratulate you for spending the time today stepping back from the day-to-day -day activities and really examining what makes uh, those learning communities work specifically in the business department in the business area. Now today as our keynote speaker we have a person that needs no introduction but I will give you his introduction because he's very very interesting. You see him on television all the time you know and uh, simply saying and uh, f uh, reporting from um, X place uh, this is T1 Cha and uh, I want to read you a little bit, T.Y. Chang, I'm nervous here, but listen to this, people. Mr. Chang is a recipient of numerous awards. In 1996, he won the prestigious Peabody Award, and I think that some of you know what that means, for a series of reports that he filed on accusing, accused drug dealing murderers. In 2004, he won the New York Press Club Award for his report on sh a shooting at City Hall. He received the Edward G. R. Morrow Award in 2005 for a piece exposing police officers using a helicopter and high-tech infrared equipment to spy on private citizens. Mr. Chang is especially proud of discovering the four witnesses to the 1963 murder of Medgar Evers, which led to the reopening of the famous case. Mr. Chang, has also won four Emmys, the Philadelphia, Denver, Detroit Press Association Awards, and the Associated Press and United Press International Awards. So when you see Mr. Chang's face on television saying, reporting from Brooklyn, or reporting from Bayside, New York, uh, you see the face, and you see the reporting, and you say, this is good reporting. But what you don't see is the tremendous history and the tremendous accomplishments of this man. So I am delighted that he has given us uh, so much of uh, a little bit of his very, very, very busy schedule to come in and say a few words to you. So with my pleasure, Mr. Shang.
Thank you. Nice to meet you. I should note there's another reason why they would all know me is because I've been in a lot of TV stations because I get fired a lot. Uh, my new song is like Motel 6 from Johnny Cash. I've been everywhere, man. I've been at Channel 2. I got fired there and I went to Channel 4. Uh, 11 and a half years, got laid off there. Went back to Channel 2, which was fun. It's three years. Then I left for Channel 9 and then they promoted me, moved me over to Channel 5. And while I was at Channel 4, I, was, I began as a freelancer. And uh, I was so nervous about being a freelancer, I took a second job at Channel 31. I was working two jobs for one year until I just couldn't do it anymore. It was a 90-hour week. So if you recognize me, it's because you put us flip channels a lot. <laughs> so um, I, um, Christine asked me to come here to talk about a particular topic. I, I understand most of you are faculty members and the business students who won the debate competition. and. Um, it's kind of an odd topic for a reporter, but I, I, I gave it my best try, and that, that is to tell you how I would teach a class to be proud of their ethnicity. And um, I don't know why I, I should know that, other than my name is T.Y. Chang. That might be one reason. Uh, and so I thought I would begin by telling you about my name. Before I do that, uh, Suzanne, Dick says, you know, hello, that's, uh, Dick Brennan's a reporter at Channel 5. His, his older sister's here, he said, yeah, she's younger sister. younger sister. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> younger sister. I have to correct. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I have to correct. I, I stand corrected. I am standing. And uh, but he said that's good because he said all the older siblings bossed him around and told him what to do. So that's probably why Dick is so anti-authority right now. But in general, which is good because you have to be anti-authority if you're going to cover the government. That's our job as journalists, I think. And it's also one of the reasons why I kept getting fired. Um, Mayor Giuliani hated me, so. And I did some good stories about Mayor Giuliani, and I never understood why he hated me until one of the photographers said to me, well, you know, you kicked him in the nuts once. I think that's be enough no matter what you did the rest of the time, so. Uh, nuts is okay to say, isn't it? I'm sorry. I wasn't sure. This isn't, uh, isn't G-rated, so. So my name is Tiwa Chang. In Chinese, which is tonal, it would actually be Zhang Tihua. So it's the last family name, last, first, and then the given name. And uh, um, so I say Tihua Chang because most people can't even get Tihua Chang right. So if I asked them to say tonally Zhang Tihua, they'd go crazy on it. So I figure that's close enough. Uh, my name in Chinese, uh, Chang means long, and Tihua means to lift up China uh, spiritually. My mother was very uh, uh, proud of being Chinese, and she named my brother Hanhua, which means defend China, and Tihua means to lift up China. And my, in, in Chinese families, uh, there's something called a generational portion of your name. And in my generation, Hua, meaning China, is the generational name. My cousins are Fuhua, Minghua, Tihua, Hanhua, everyone's got the Hua in there. Is anyone named Howard here in this room? No Howards here. Good. I want to make sure there are no Howards here. I don't want to insult anybody. Uh, when I was growing up in public school, they renamed you. Now, any child who didn't have a name like John or Bob or Robert, uh, uh, anyone who had a name like Hanhua, my brother's name, or Eduardo, it had to be Ed. And so my older brother came home from PS 165. Uh, which, by the way, was listed in Life magazine as the worst public school in America when I went there, and which we were very proud of because, man, we made Life magazine. You know, it was like, <laughs> damn. So we, um, in fact, it was the day that we had to be locked in the room because uh, locked in our classrooms because there was a guy with a knife in the bathrooms. But then Life magazine came out, so it made everything better. So he came back from school, and uh, I, he's four years older than me, and he came back and he, he said his teacher had changed his name to Howard. And I remember thinking, holy moly, Howard. And I started teasing him, Howard the Coward. And this just went on for a long time, and I said, what a dumb name. Your name's Hawa. How could it be Howard? And, and, but that's what they did. So four years later, I get the same second grade teacher. I'm seven years old. And she asked me, what's your name? I said, my name's Tiwa, and I'm, I know what's coming. And she says to me, we're going to name you. And I said, no, you're not. Because you're not giving me some stupid name like Howard. I got a name. My name is T.Y. And you're not changing my name. 
because I'm not going home, because then if you give me a name, my brother's going to tease me for four more years. So my name remained Tiwa. <laughs> um, when I graduated from Columbia in journalism school and I had a master's degree, I couldn't get a job. And my brother said, you know, maybe because of your name, Tiwa. <laughs> he said, you know, you're in television news and they probably think you can't speak English. I said, okay, well, that's, that's a problem. He said, well, so I wrote down, I wrote down, well, I put my picture in the corner, TV, that didn't help. Uh, traveled around the country, that didn't help. Then I wrote under my name, Tiwa Chang, I wrote U.S. citizen. <laughs> so my brother said, uh, well, you know, they probably think you just got, you had a green card and you just got your naturalization papers. <laughs> so I changed my name at that point to T.H. Chang. T period, H period, and I put underneath born in New York City. And I wanted to actually write born in New York City, you stupid so-and-so, I'm an American, I can speak. But I just put T.H. Chang, born in New York City. Still couldn't get work. Finally met a guy uh, who helped me out, Al Idelson. Sent a letter out all over the country and the only response I got was from Biloxi, Mississippi. Drove down to Biloxi, Mississippi, and I was T.H. Chang, Newsline 13, Biloxi, Gulfport, Pascagoula. Where I lived, by the way, was wiped out by Katrina, the, uh, the, the, the apartment complex I lived in. So that was okay, because you know, when you're in television, it really doesn't matter what you look like. It's only, I, I try to think of myself as a giant, well, not maybe flat screen now, but flat screen TV set is my face. It really doesn't matter who you are, what you are, because the television is so much more important than you. When people see the TV camera, it doesn't matter. I learned this in Colorado, where I worked, where I went to a place that I thought was a really cool place, had dinner there. I came back with my then girlfriend and they wouldn't serve me. And I realized they served me because I was on TV. And when they saw someone Asian coming to the place, they didn't really want to serve us. So in any case, so I was in, in Biloxi, Mississippi, and then I got a job in Philadelphia. And as I was leaving for Philadelphia, the, uh, another reporter to me uh, turned to me and said, you know, what does TH stand for? And I said, it stands for Tihua. And he looked at me and he said, uh, well, why didn't you use it? I said, well, you know, it's the South. There's JC, DW. I figured TH will be good, you know. And he said, well, and I said to him, besides, what difference does it make? You know, it's still, it's not like I can hide who I am and my ethnicity is obvious. And he said, and I will never forget this. He said to me, well, you know, for those Vietnamese kids living in New Orleans, had you used Tihua, it might have made a big difference to them. And I looked at him and I said something, I won't repeat because that lady got very upset over nuts, but I said something to him <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, you're absolutely right. And from that point on, my name has always been Tiwa Chang. I didn't change it after that. So I've had, I have families, I had families, it doesn't happen very often anymore, because other people have adopted this, but uh, I've had families come up to me and say, parents say thank you, because when my son or daughter sees your name on TV, they feel proud enough to use their name. They're not asking to use John or Ed or Howard. <laughs> and they're proud to use their ethnic name. And uh, so for that, you know, I, it's fine. Although I named my son Tyler, uh, I gave him a Chinese name in the middle. Uh, his name is Tyler Shishin Chang. So when he grows up, he can choose whatever name he wants. If he wants to stick to Tyler, it's fine. If he wants Shishin, he can use that. Shishin, by the way, in Chinese means New West. So he's like a cowboy. <laughs> I also, you know, use two different phonetic systems. So it's Tyler X Chang, because I hope he'll become a hip hop guy and support mommy and daddy. <laughs> So how would I teach, um, how would I teach students to respect themselves? And I think it comes down to number one, the instructor respecting the student more than anything else. If a student, if I were a student or if I were a faculty and I sensed that my instructor respected me, respected my ethnicity, respected me as a person as well, I would give them respect back. I also think it has to do with knowledge. In writing, one of the techniques of writing is the more you know about a character, the more you care about that character. 
Uh, if I tell you John got hit by a car, okay, he got hit by a car. But if I tell you John, you know, who moved to this country at the age of five without a mother and father, worked on the streets until he grew to be a man, and then raised a family and worked two jobs and, and uh, worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and then on his way to his third job got run over by a car, now you care a little more that John got run over by a car. So knowledge about a character makes a big difference. I think I would ask if I had an ethnic class, hopefully it would be diverse, and I'm assuming in Queens it would be, I would ask two students of different ethnicities to stand in front of the class and tell me their ethnicity. And then I would ask the student to tell me what they knew about the other person's ethnicity, and then vice versa. Um, one of the reasons I came up with this is, I'll tell you in a second, because I can't read my handwriting here. Ask two students, okay, I passed that part. Okay, here, for example, uh, let me have a show of hands here. Let me play the teacher. How many people know, how many people were killed, murdered by the Nazis? How many Jews were murdered by the Nazis in World War II? Okay. How many people know the number of Chinese that were murdered by the Japanese in World War II? Not even the Asians? Come on, people. Yo. What up? <laughs> how many people here know how many members or, or uh, citizens of the so former Soviet Republic were murdered by the Nazis in World War II? More than know about the Chinese. Six million Jews were killed by the Nazis. Ten million, a minimum of ten, possibly as many as 20 million were killed. Chinese were killed by the Japanese in World War II. And 22 million former citizens, uh, citizens of the former Soviet Republic were murdered by the Nazis. Most people don't know anything about any other ethnicity. They know about one's own, but not about others. I'll give you an example, if I can read my handwriting. Yes, I can. I went to Beirut in 1985 um, because the, the American, American, an American airplane, a TWA flight, had been uh, hijacked. And so I flew to Beirut. I was a reporter in Detroit at the time. And I happened to know some Arab Americans, Lebanese Americans. A friend of mine, now, now I call him a friend. His name is Hamzi Abbas. He had a, uh, a gasoline station. And did you know you don't make money on gasoline? You only make money on the candy? Did you know that? Anyway, so we went to Beirut together. And um, I learned a lot about the re religious divide there and uh, how you don't even ask people about their religion. And Hamzi was the, his wife was the cousin of uh, Nabi Berry, who was the head of the Amal militia. Uh, I think it was Hezbollah that kidnapped uh, or hijacked the plane, and they turned over the American hostages to the Amal militia. And uh, she must be a history professor because she was nodding her head, so I guess I'm right. But in case, anyway, we met with Nabi Berry, the head of the Amo militia. And uh, Hamzi would always ask me about um, what I knew about uh, Lebanon and what I knew about Arab culture. And he would laugh, and he once asked me, so what's your religion? Do you worship those cows? And when he said that to me, I asked him, well, Hamzi, what do you know about Chinese history? And Hamzi drew a complete blank. He knew absolutely nothing about China. I mean, literally nothing about China. He knew nothing about the rich history, he knew nothing about religion, war, he knew nothing about the Civil War, he knew nothing about modern or ancient Chinese history. Now, despite our difference in that, in my having his requirement that I know, and this was even when we came back to the States, that I know everything about Lebanon, whenever we would meet, he, would never, he never learned about much about China until much later. But one thing I learned, and I think this is also something important to teach, in the sense as, as we teach uniqueness, it's important to teach universality. Um, 
this was the example I chose. It sounds a little bit like bragging, but it really isn't because I was really scared when this happened. But when the American hostages got released, I was actually with them. And because um, Hamzi got me in. And so there was a huge convoy of cars because they took the American hostages east from Beirut across the Shuf Mountains to Damascus. They were, going to, they were released in Damascus, Syria. Uh, the Shuf Mountains are, were, were and probably still are controlled by a different militia, which escapes me the name right now. But So we're driving in this convoy with all the reporters in different cars and, and uh, Hamzi, being, you know, living in America for 20 years, was used to automatic. And everyone there had you know, uh, manual transmissions. So when he slammed on the brake coming down a road in the Shuf Mountains, he hit the clutch and he smashed into the car right in front of him. And uh, nobody was hurt, but it knocked out the radiator. So we went another two or three miles, and then everybody, the car overheated, and everybody, all the journalists who were in a daily deadline, including myself, jumped out of the car and literally jumped onto the other cars that were filled with other journalists heading behind the hostages to go to Damascus. But each of these cars were coming from and controlled by the AMA militia. And each car had a soldier, uh, and he had, he had an AK-47. Now, this soldier is stuck in the Shuf Mountains, and he's from the Amo militia. And he's stuck in the Shuf Mountains, where it's a completely different militia. And he's armed. And, the, and he's probably going to die, because, like, why are you in our territory armed unless one journalist stays with him? And so I had to make a decision, a split decision. Do I stay with this young man, or do I make my deadline, which is good for my career, and he'll probably die. So I thought about it. I said, you know, career, death, career, death, you know. I went back and forth a little bit, and the next day I looked up, the car was gone. That was going to take me. It was too late anyway. So, but no, I did make a decision. I decided to stay. And I walked up to the, the people from the other militia, and I said, uh, you know, I raised my hands. I learned how to say, don't kill me. I'm a journalist. And I said, you know, Sahafi, Sahafi, which means journalist. But my being there, especially because I'm Chinese-American, it was obvious I was not from Lebanon, and, meant, and I stayed with him the whole day. Uh, after that, uh, for the next week that I stayed in Beirut, um, uh, other things happened. I got shot at. I almost got killed. And... A lot of funny things happened, so it was a very different experience after that. But after that, all the Amal people who met me would always nod their head toward me. And I didn't understand why they would nod their head. I thought, okay, maybe because they saw this Chinese guy, they think I'm Bruce Lee. Because um, someone actually said that to me. He yelled, Bruce Lee, and I said, Omar Sharif. And then anyway, so they... <laughs> but what had happened was that in the Amal militia, they had said, that I was a man of honor, that I had courage, that I would not abandon the soldier because I knew he would die. So the entire AMO militia got word that Chinese guy with Hamzi, he's okay. So that's universality. And I think that's what I would try and teach a class. I would teach a class our uniqueness, but I would also teach our universality as human beings. Everywhere I have been in the world, um, there's something that I've kept with me that was from a friend of mine from a different war. And um, my friend's name, he's dead now, uh, it was Larry Newsom. He's my best friend. He was a spec for uh, army power, paratrooper in Vietnam. Those of you who don't know the, Vietnamese, the history of the Vietnam War, the paratroopers, at least according to Larry, went in before the Marines. So Larry, in 1966, at the age of 24, spent six months in Vietnam being shot at and being killed, or well, having friends killed next to him, killing other people. But when I met Larry, he said to me, in Vietnam, there were two soldiers, soldiers who would kill babies and soldiers who would not kill babies. He said, I never killed a baby. And so Larry said to me that his last day after six months of tour duty in Vietnam, he met an elderly Vietnamese man under, he said, the only tree in a rice paddy that he saw in Vietnam. 
And the guy was wearing an all white, um, I guess, native costume, and he had a white beard. And Larry was not high, and if you knew Larry, Larry was the most honest person I've ever met in my life. And he went up to this Vietnamese man who spoke English. And in hindsight, Larry realized he was probably the enemy, the Viet Cong. And he said to this old man, he said, you know, uh, I'm going back to America today, tomorrow. My tour of duty is done. And I'm going to go to a country where you can touch a button and turn night into day, where you can fly like the wind and you can eat meat at every meal. And the old man just looked at him, wasn't impressed. And Larry, being all of 24 years old and being angry about the combat and his friends being killed, said, well, what is it you want? What is it you people want? And the old man said to him in English, very slowly and deliberately, said, I want to grow my rice, raise my children, and die in peace. That's what I want to do. And Larry went back home and he said he could never forget that, to grow your rice, raise your children, and die in peace. And everywhere I have gone in the world, from Bosnia to Lebanon to the Philippines to China to Mexico to every war zone and riot and revolution and hurricane I've covered, I have found that to be true for every single people that I've met. Grow my rice, raise my children, and die in peace. And I think, since Queens is the most diverse borough and the most diverse city in the world, making this probably the most diverse uh, area in the entire world, this should be pretty easy. Uh, there are more countries represented in Queens than any other place in the world per square mile. I would emphasize our uniqueness, and even more so, our universality. And I really can't read my writing here. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll say it right this time. Tiwa Chang. I just remembered what I wanted to write. <laughs> this is actually important. Yesterday I spoke at PS124, an elementary school in Chinatown. And the whole thing was about teaching these little kids why education is important. And I've, I'm not used to speaking to little kids. So it wasn't a very good speech. And, 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 the, and as I was taking the subway to work, I thought the one thing I should have said to these kids is that your parents push you really hard to study. Remember, they do it because they love you so much. And I hope that that message would be felt by your students, that your instructor loves you so much too, and that's why they're pushing you so hard. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have something to express our gratitude for your time, but before we do that, I want to take the prerogative of the chair, so to speak, to tell you two things. In this very room, about six years ago, there was a man named Mr. Unger, who was a Holocaust survivor, who was talking about his experiences in the Second World War. And that was something that was sponsored by our Holocaust Resource Center. And in that room, in that chair right there, was a Chinese woman who at the end of the lecture asked Mr. Unger, what is the Holocaust? And he started describing the whole process of what happened in Germany in the Second World War. And she said, boy, that sounds like what happened to my grandparents in Nanjing. And as a result of that, we've had now for almost six years, an exhibit on the massacre of the Chinese by the Japanese during the Second World War in Nanjing, where in about 14 days, over 300,000 people were murdered at point blank. The Holocaust Resource Center that we have at the college, and I do hope that you cover it, because it is important, is about using the lessons of the Holocaust to study prejudice. 
And another thing that is important, and it's 130 countries that are represented in our campus, we are all have been subject of prejudice at one point or another. Queensborough Community College and its Holocaust Resource Center is a hate crimes unit for the city of New York. Anytime there is an action against anyone that is based on hate, we are called to action and we're there. So it is important that as part of your education, the faculty and the students are able to take advantage of the resources that are available at the Holocaust Resource Center. And it's not just about the Holocaust. It's about Darfur, it's about Rwanda, it's about all of the different genocides and massacres that have taken place in this world. And let me just finish by relaying a little story that many of you might not know. When we had the Nanjing exhibit, we invited the General Consul of China, of the People's Republic, here. And uh, we were going through the, he thought it was a meet and greet, he was here for two minutes and uh, of that, that was it. And then, as I started talking to him, I said, do you realize that my grandmother was half African and half Chinese? And I don't know about, if, if you know, but there is one thing about the Chinese culture that men who are friends hold hands with the General Consul of the People's Republic held my hand throughout the two hours that they spent here at the campus. And my Chinese name is Ma Adai, right? So if I mispronounce your name at the very beginning, excuse me, but uh, it is important that we identify ourselves and our heritage by the way that we call ourselves. So with that, I want to thank you for a very inspiring talk. I think it's extremely important that students understand the value of diversity. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marti. Um, Christine Mooney would like to say a few words. I, first, I want to thank you tremendously for agreeing to come to Queensboro and speak to us today. I think we all enjoyed you tremendously. Um, so thank you. Um, unfortunately, money, you know, because we are part of the city university, we couldn't offer an honorarium, but the bookstore was kind enough to donate what we are calling the Queensboro Executive Basket. Okay, and I put this together for you. There's a Queensboro tote bag, a mug, a pen, and a portfolio keeper with a pad so that at work you will constantly be reminded about your friends and colleagues at Queensboro. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, just, just so you know, we're not allowed to take money anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> I, I've known Tiwa for a number of years and we first met when I was the Director of Human Resources at LaGuardia when Tiwa came and spoke to the chairs from Queensboro and LaGuardia and was as inspiring then as he is now. And so for me it's tremendous to have had you here today and I'm grateful for our friendship and for you coming. He also has agreed to take a couple of questions so I wanted to open it up now um, and give this back to Jonas in case anyone does have a question. That's because I was at the session, was it seven years ago? And I heard that story and I thought it was wonderful at the time and it's just as wonderful today. So thank you for telling us that. <laughs> does, does anybody have any questions you has agreed to answer? Okay, thanks. Well, we have one person. We do have one. Go ahead. Didn't your mother object to your brother being called Howard? Uh, let's see, let me think about this. At his age, you know, I don't think my mother spoke English well enough at the time. And I don't think, uh, and plus she was working, little connection to Queensborough Community College. My mother was a nurse, you know, 38 years at St. Luke's Hospital, so I hear you have a great nursing program here. But no, I don't, I don't think she even, they were doing what everybody did back then. Uh, actually, to tell you the truth, when I objected to having another name, I got demoted as a discipline problem. They dropped me down a grade, the, a level, which sent my parents into a panic. But, uh, and at that point, Actually, at that, after that point, I became more and more of a discipline problem every year. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, oh, go ahead. how did you develop your interest in journalism? Um, my father was a journalist. In fact, uh, 
My father was a lawyer. Okay. My father was illiterate till he was 15 years old. And then he taught himself. He worked as, as a pharmacy apprentice. And by the time he was 27, he graduated from the equivalent of Harvard Law School in China, Tsinghua University. He was super disciplined, would work 16 hours a day because he felt knowledge was a joy. He said, learning to me is a luxury. That, it, that every time I can learn, I feel as if I'm in the richest place in the world. He became a lawyer, and he uh, didn't like uh, prosecuting the poor, and he didn't want to defend uh, rich, guilty people. This was in a time of China that was very corrupt. So he became a reporter, and he was a great reporter, in fact. He, was, uh, he wrote several books. He was on the Missouri when the Japanese surrendered. He was the first Allied correspondent to go to Hiroshima. He bribed his way over there. We have pictures where I never understood till I was older. There were all these streaks on the, on the photographs that came from the radiation. He also developed, 40 years later, rheumatoid arthritis, which the doctors believe he got from radiation poisoning at Hiroshima. Uh, but he was a journalist. You want a short answer or a long answer? Right, let's see. Um, can I, the, the, the short answer is uh, I became a journalist by accident. No, okay, the full story. So my father told me he didn't want me to be a journalist. I was just telling Irving, the driver, this on the way over. He said, you know, when you're on the top, you have no friends. When you're on the bottom, when you're on the top, you have a lot of friends. When you're on the bottom, you have no friends. And I said to my father, but dad, I'm on the bottom and I have friends. And he said, okay, I guess then you have some good friends. And then, so uh, he wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, I think most Asian kids will hear from their family, doctor, lawyer, accountant, engineer, there's a reason for that. That's because those are skills you can take anywhere, especially a doctor. That you can go to any society, anywhere, you can run if you have to, and you'll still be able to survive. And I think that's why a lot of Asian parents do that. Uh, so they wanted me to be a doctor, and um, what happened? Oh, then I ran into a poem uh, called Sunday Morning, and I stopped, started skipping all the you know, I was a math, high school math award winner, physics award, science award, Westinghouse quarter finalist. I was in the biomedical engineering at Penn. And then I had read this poem called Sunday Morning, and I skipped all my classes for two weeks, and I only did the poem. And that set me on a whole course. I still finished in biology because my parents would have committed suicide if I hadn't. And then, uh, then a fiance of mine said to me, I want you to be a lawyer. I'm going to break up with you. And I said, why? She said, because I want you to be a lawyer. I said, I don't want to be a lawyer. I'll compromise. I'll become a journalist because I wanted to be a writer. Hemingway was a journalist. I'll be a writer. I went to Columbia Journalism School. They accepted me, much to my surprise, gave me a fellowship. And that's that. She died of cancer, and I became a television reporter. So, long end. Yes. I did. I graduated from Columbia Grammar and Preparatory School. My father was a librarian there, so we were able to get a scholarship. They, they brought me there after I was the discipline problem in the public school. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I want to thank you on behalf of the business department, the best department at Queensboro and the university. Thank you very, very much. Everyone, lunch is now served, so please. Right there in the hallway. Thank you very much for coming. See you next year. <laughs>